how bright they are. And then you can look at how bright they appear and figure out fa how far away they are. And they did this, and this is a plot of the, how far the universe is expanding and the brightness of the supernovae. And if the universe was expanding at a constant rate, you would expect the distant supernovae to be lying on this dotted line. And actually, you see all these red points lying above the dotted line. So this is the evidence that actually, if we go back far enough, if you know about astronomy, if we go back to red shifts of something like 80%, then actually we can see that the expansion of the universe is uh, speeding up, and it's speeding up through this uh, thing called uh, dark matter. And this is the last transparency I'll show about it. This just shows the uh, density of dark matter plot plotted against the gravitating matter. <coughs> and the two domains here are a universe which decelerates as it expands, and a universe that accelerates. And this shows you that uh, all our measurements are consistent with the universe that's expanding more rapidly as time goes on. That's just the other thing about it. But I can't say anything about this dark energy that makes any sense at all. Uh, and I don't think anyone else can actually. But what I can talk about is uh, the supersymmetry, the dark matter. Because I said to you, we believe that, uh, or we observe, that uh, there's gravitating matter, matter which is influenced by gravity which uh, is not the sort of matter we make, we're made of. And uh, actually, particle physicists need this sort of matter. We need a thing called supersymmetry. Because if we don't have uh, p other particles than the ones we see, then this uh, holy Higgs boson that we want to find at the LHC, for quantum mechanical reasons, its mass would run away to infinity. So we know there must be something that the parlance of physicists protects the mass of the Higgs boson which keeps it fairly light. I also showed you that uh, uh, plot where all the three forces came together into one primordial force. And that can only happen if we posit the existence of particles and forces that we've never seen, which seems a bit extravagant, but we'll see whether it's extravagant or not when we go to the LHC. What we say is that all particles, all the quarks and leptons, have what are called superpartners. Now, I haven't talked about it, but some of you know about this, that leptons and quarks have half a unit of angular momentum, and the photons and the Ws have one unit of angular momentum. You know, they're sort of spinning on their axes. So we, uh, we sort of explain that, or describe that by saying the matter particles, the quarks and the leptons, carry half a unit of angular momentum. They spin at a certain speed. And all the force particles, like the photons and the Ws and the gluons, spin at twice the speed in sort of everyday language. What we say is that there is a completely shadow universe which is made out of particles which are the opposite way around, where these uh, sleptons and squarks, as we call them, <laughs> supersymmetric quarks and leptons, they have one unit of angular momentum, whereas the ones we see around us have a half. And the carrier bosons, like the W and the Z and the, and the photon, have spin a half, they have angular momentum, a half partners that go with them, which are called bosinos. Now, these super, super partners, nobody's ever seen them. Uh, so do they exist? We don't know. Because if supersymmetry exists, what it says is that the particles we see are lighter than their super partners. And the only way we can get to the super partners is to produce them with a particle accelerator. Now, for technical reasons, namely for to protect the mass of the Higgs particle, these uh, super partners have to have a mass which, is, which can be made at the LHC. So if we run the LHC and we don't see the super partners, we're in, we're in real trouble because we don't know anything about the uh, theory anymore. There's something terribly wrong with it. <coughs> What's the connection of these uh, supersymmetric particles? We call them Susie for short. What's the connection uh, between SUSY and dark matter? Well, the connection is that uh, early in the universe, these SUSY particles decayed into the particles we see around us. However, this decay chain could only go so far. At some point, there was a SUSY particle that couldn't decay anymore. So every time you started out with a very heavy SUSY particle on the Big Bang, there was a cascade decay where it produced the normal matter, and then there's a SUSY particle right at the end of this that's left over for the lifetime of the universe. And what we believe is that they're all lying around us, that the whole of space is full of these uh, SUSY particles that were the bottom of this decay chain. <coughs> and they are what's called the dark matter. 
So we would actually hope to produce them at the Large Hadron Collider. And this is sort of a cartoon of how we do an experiment to produce these uh, SUSY particles. You know, we have to produce a SUSY and an anti-SUSY at the time for at the same time for what we call quantum number conservation. So what we do is we take a particle and its antiparticle. This picture shows an electron and a positron, but the LHC is actually a proton and a proton. And you probably know that you can take the energy of motion in particles and special relativity and change this energy of motion into mass. It's like the inverse of a nuclear weapon. In a nuclear weapon or a reactor, you take the mass of uh, uranium atoms and you turn it into energy. So essentially what a particle accelerator does is the opposite. If we give these uh, beams enormous kinetic energies, we can turn that kinetic energy into the masses of particles that haven't existed since uh, shortly after the Big Bang. And where we're doing it is uh, this place, CERN in Geneva. So this red circle, the actual accelerator is 50 meters below ground, and it's 25 kilometers around in circumference. This is Lake Geneva, and that's Mont Blanc, and this is the Alps, and that's the airport of Geneva. But it's an enormous thing. It's 25 kilometers around. And the reason it has to be so big is that when you get particles up to these enormous energies, the way you make them go around in a circle is because they have electric charges, you can bend them with a magnet. But as they go to higher and higher momenta, or higher and higher velocities, they're harder and harder to bend. You need to use more and more intense magnetic fields. And the most intense magnetic fields we can make, we make with these magnets, uh, which uh, have a field of eight Tesla. Believe me, that's an intense magnetic field. And these things are magnets which are 15, me 15 meters long. <coughs> and in this accelerator, there are about 2,000 of them. And they're all kept at 1.9 degrees Kelvin, just above the absolute zero, so they're completely superconducting. They uh, they have no electrical resistance at all. So these magnets, they're electromagnets, they're coils of wire, but instead of being coils of copper wire, they're coils of niobium tin. And a niobium tin alloy, when it gets down to 1.9 mm. degrees Kelvin, there's no electrical resistance. So they carry 15,000 amps in the wires, which would vaporize your kettle in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> These are some of the magnets. Uh, what I'm going to show you now are some pictures of this device. And what I wanted to do was to give you some motivation for why we wanted to be so extravagant as to build this accelerator and the detector. The accelerator has actually cost something like six billion dollars. And the experiment we work on has cost about half a billion. So that's a lot of money. Uh, these are uh, the magnets uh, being ready for, uh, ready for testing. And this blue thing is a cryostat, which keeps the magnet inside down at 1.9 degrees Kelvin. And remember, there are 2,000 of them. And each one has to be perfect, because if you have a superconducting wire with 10 or 15,000 amps in it, and it stops superconducting, then it vaporizes. So there's a lot of work to go in to... Uh, have I, I'm going backwards now. Okay, so this is one of the magnets being moved around. And it sort of shows you the complicated structure inside the magnet. And you can't read it here, but if, uh, if this was a big picture, you'd see that this thing said on it, Robotruck. And I always like this picture because I think that uh, this is like something out of, uh, you know, some science fiction movie, like The Terminator or something, that this uh, computer-controlled Robotruck is riding around with these big arms. Anyway, this thing uh, runs under computer control and carries these magnets out, and it's an impressive sight to see, and then they go into this tunnel. This is inside the LHC tunnel, and it's empty at the moment, and since it's 25 kilometers around, you can barely see it bending. You know, it would take you a while to ride your bicycle around it, although people have done that before the machine was installed. This is a picture of the last of these great superconducting magnets being lowered down into the, uh, the tunnel, and they come down this big uh, shaft. And these are people standing at the bottom of the side shaft. So it gives you some image of the size of these magnets. And then this is a, it's an enormously complicated thing because you have to connect up all the cables between the magnets. You have to connect up services that will run at uh, 1.9 degrees Kelvin, 4 degrees Kelvin, 80 degrees Kelvin, and up to room temperature. And it all has to work because once you switch it on, if there's a problem with it, you can destroy the whole thing. So when you read about delays in the LHC, if you ever have it, a few months, 
is because bringing these things down into the tunnel, you know, people have to do an initial test, and then there are lots of welds have to be done on them, and then another test, and inevitably you find problems and it slows things down a little bit. So this was what the accelerator looked like in March of 2006, where uh, the ma many of the magnets had actually been installed in the tunnel, and this is what it looks like now. That's not a very bright picture, but this is the accelerator essentially finished, where there are all the services that bring liquid helium at 1.9 degrees Kelvin into it. And there's a couple of exhausted guys leaning against the tunnel because it's taken them 10 years to finish this thing. And this is sort of a propaganda picture to show you that the machine is almost running. This is the first cool down to 1.9 degrees Kelvin of part of the machine. And I'm not sure what uh, entering this zone as a professional fault means. It probably means if you come in here, you'll get fired. <laughs> okay, so now what I'm going to spend a little bit of time doing is talking about uh, the experiments and uh, the things that we've built in Canada to go into this experiment. This is what I call a small generic experiment. You have the particles colliding in the detector at, the, at some point. So the particles collide and you produce all these new particles from the kinetic energy of the colliding particles. You hope Higgs bosons and super partners and whatnot. And you surround the uh, interaction region, as we call it, with layers of different detectors. And each of these uh, different detectors measures some of the energy of the particles, and it also tries to figure out what kind of particle it is. And I've got a little, uh, a little animation here, which I'm not sure <coughs> I can get to work, but I'll try at least, which shows you how this works if I press this button. Okay, so this is a photon coming in. And you see the photon interacts in a thing called the electromagnetic cal calorimeter. Then uh, the what's this? This is a pro. This is a, the electron comes in, and you see its track in the tracking chamber, and you see it showering in the electromagnetic uh, calorimeter. This is a muon coming in, and it goes all the way through the detector. So what we do to make an experiment is to take these different detectors and wrap them like a sort of Swiss roll around the interaction point, and each of these detectors detects the energy of a different kind of particle. So from the electrical signals coming from all these different kinds of detectors, we can figure out what happened uh, when the two beams collided. Now, oh no, what's happened now? Okay. This is where I always have trouble. To, oh no, no trouble tonight. So this is a, a CAD drawing of where the experiment sits. So this is the, uh, this is the uh, machine tunnel the 27 kilo, uh, kilometer circumference tunnel, and this is the Atlas detector sitting at the bottom of it. The Atlas detector is uh, 55 meters long, uh, 32 meters wide, and uh, 35 meters uh, high. And, uh, whoops, that goes the wrong way. This, again, is a computer drawing of it, and I obviously can't tell you about all the complicated technology that goes into this. But uh, I'll tell you about the things that Canadians have built. And what Canadians have built are these sort of brown things sitting at each end of the detector. And you can, you can see the scale of this detector because there's two people standing beside it and there's another two people down there. So it's an enormous thing. And uh, well, you'd hope that for half a billion dollars you've got something big. <laughs> so here's the, this, uh, this is the Atlas physicist map of the world. We divide the, the world into two camps, the nations that belong to our experiment and the nations that don't belong to our experiment. And there are 35 countries, and I have to read this, 164 institutions. And actually now there are more than 2,000 PhD physicists working on it. And then red. These are all the institutions, things like my hometown of Glasgow is in there, and there's places like Krakow, Moscow, Pennsylvania, blah, blah, blah. But the ones that are important for us are Alberta, uh, Alberta, Montreal, McGill, Regina, Simon Fraser, Toronto Triumph, UBC, and Victoria. So these are the institutions in Atlas that come from Canada, and I'd like to show you a few pictures of what we've made in Canada. But first of all, just to get the scale right for the experiment. Uh, this is the cavern back in uh, 2003 that we were going to put the atlas into. And you can get the scale of this because this thing down here is one of those uh, pre-mixed concrete dump trucks. So the way the concrete is put into the cavern is they take a pre-mixed truck, put it on the crane and lower it down into the cavern, cavern and then it uh, puts the concrete around the edges of the cavern. So it's an enormous uh, in the ground. 
And this is uh, later that year, which has still got a truck, but this is a crane truck which is starting to lift parts of the detector up onto the sides of the cavern. And this hole here is where the beams from the ILC will come through. This is in, uh, a year later, where the cavern is starting to be filled with parts of the experiment. And again, you still see the uh, hole where the uh, Large Hadron Collider beams will come. And the, again, the scale is given by these people standing beside it. So you start to see what an enormously complicated task it is to build this thing. This does not show up very well because of the projector, but it's a large superconducting magnet, which is part of our experiment, which is being lowered down. And it doesn't look very big here, but uh, the diameter of this is probably one and a half times the height of this room and about half the length of the room. <coughs> so that, again, gives you some idea of the scale of this experiment, which is being built down there. And then these are more magnets. And this, uh, again, they come down this uh, shaft from up on the surface. And these are big racetrack magnets. There's eight of them. Uh, they're actually made in the Soviet Union. And these are also superconducting. So inside these chambers, it's 1.9 degrees Kelvin. And they're not small. Somewhere on this picture, there's a guy beside a little uh, forklift. Here's the guy beside the forklift. This is the looking on the end of this thing. So again, they're enormous uh, pieces of equipment that cost a lot of money. <coughs> okay. This is when all the magnets have been assembled. So you're looking in the end of the Atlas detector that the LHC beams would come out here. And these are the, uh, all these magnets which are used to bend the particles coming out of the interaction. And there's a person standing down there, uh, one of the engineers. And again, it shows you the scale of this... Uh, Thing. This, I'm not going to try and tell you what this is all about, it's just to give you an impression of the complexity of the experiment. But this one down in the bottom, if you can see it, there's people working on lots of cables. If you know the U of T physics department, that 14-story tower, all the electronics that goes into Atlas would fill all of the physics department with crates of electronics to try and process the data coming out of it. Because the beams from the LHC they collide every 25 nanoseconds throughout the year. So what's a nanosecond? A second is a second. A millisecond is a thousandth of a second. A microsecond is a thousandth of a thousandth of a second. What's a nanosecond? It's 10 to the minus 9. It's 10 to the minus 9. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a thousand, thousand, thousandth of a second. So every, every 25 nanoseconds, the beams collide and produce the bursts of particles. And while Atlas is running, the total amount of information coming out of it which we try to process is equal to all the conversations going on in the telephone systems in the world. Every telephone conversation in the world added up uh, is about the same as the data that's coming out of Atlas. In nine months, the data coming out of Atlas would fill uh, a pile of uh, DVDs twice the height of the CN Tower. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about things for maybe another five or ten minutes, which uh, we built in, Cal in Canada, which are called calorimeters. Basically, it's a particle detector. At some level, it's a block of metal. And if you take a block of metal and you fire a high energy particle with an electric charge on it into the block of metal, what it does is the electric charge ionizes the atoms in the metal. It strips the electrons off them. And, if you, and as it strips the electrons off the electrons in the atom, it's losing energy, so eventually it will stop. And when it stops, the energy that it had, the kinetic energy, has gone into all these electrons. And if you collect these electrons, you get an electric current out of this device. And that electric current is proportional to the energy of the incoming particle. So that's what we call a calorimeter in our parlance. This is one which was built out at, uh, in Triumph in uh, Vancouver. And it's not a terribly good picture because you cannot see the scale of it. There's nobody standing beside it. Suffice it to say that this is 138 tons of copper, and you'll see something that shows the scale of it in a minute. This is what we built at U of T, which is uh, completely made out of tungsten with a copper shell around it. We call it the forward calorimeter. And the reason we call it the forward calorimeter is it's sitting right down at the front of the detectors, uh, right beside these intense beams. So we had to develop various technologies to make it extremely radiation hard. Uh, this blue thing here is where the LHC beams would go through. 
And although it looks quite small, we chose something that was small because it would fit into the basement of the physics department to build it. Nonetheless, it's made out of uh, 15 tons of pure tungsten, and it cost us uh, of order $5 million to build it, just in uh, taking this tungsten and processing it. Okay, this gives you the scale. This is that big uh, wheel, as we call it, that was made in Triumph, and this is it sitting on a trestle to be uh, put into the experiment. And there is, I show this to give you the scale, but this is me, and this is the uh, president of the Natural Engineering and Science Research Council, Dr. Vestovsky. And you can see that I'm unusual here because I'm a little bit dressed up. And Dr. Vestovsky, who usually wears a business suit, is wearing these beat-up clothes. And I thought he would be well-dressed when he came, and he thought I would be badly dressed. So. <laughs> we were both trying to make each other uh, feel at home. This is the, uh, ca the Canadian stuff being assembled. Well, this is the forward calorimeter and the big wheel from Vancouver, and these are uh, engineers from Toronto and Triumph uh, putting the things together before they go into the LHC itself. And when we assemble these calorimeters, they go into uh, yet another cryostat. You should have become used to this uh, word cryostat because these things only work at liquid argon temperature. So all this uh, 200 tons of copper and tungsten is taken down to 80 degrees Kelvin. And it has a multitude, about 100,000 electrical signals coming out, to the, uh, coming out through all these things around here. I'm almost done. I wanted to show one thing which is not Canadian, but it's a very interesting detector. Because uh, if you have bought a digital camera, you know what a digital camera is. It's got a little chip in it, <coughs> pixels in it. He's got one there. And that one is probably, I don't know, what is it, three megapixels? I doubt it's that high. It's maybe two megapixels. But what uh, a collaboration of uh, Berkeley in the United States and Pisa in Italy did was they built this sort of cylindrical digital camera that fits around the interaction point, and it has millions of uh, pixels in it, and when the particles fly out, whereas we measure their energy by absorbing the energy in the metal, in a complementary way, they measure the energy by actually seeing the particles in this digital camera, which is taking a photograph every 25 uh, nanoseconds. Uh, this is just to remind me how many uh, channels are in this thing. So you can see that there are 10 to the 9. So what's that? That's a 1,000 uh, megapixels uh, digital camera wrapped around the thing. And what does it do? This is a picture of a Higgs boson. Except uh, you thought that I said we haven't seen a Higgs boson, and that's true. Because this is a computer simulation of a, of a Higgs boson production inside the Atlas detector. And all these red lines are particles flying out from the collision. But there's, uh, there's a collision every 25 nanoseconds. Now, since we know that there's a Higgs boson in here because we generated it in the computer, the computer can tell us where the Higgs boson is, and it's these four yellow lines are the products of the Higgs boson. But in a typical year, we would perhaps uh, produce maybe uh, at the beginning of order 50 to 100 Higgs bosons, but we'd produce all this other garbage such that it was uh, twice the height of the CN Tower of DVDs. So somehow you have to search through all these DVDs with complicated uh, computer algorithms to find the Higgs bosons. And that's why we uh, need an enormous amount of computing power. Now, I think I've run out of time, but as well as being an enormous accelerator to produce this stuff and these enormously complicated experiments, we're also putting together a very complicated computing system, which is called the grid. Now, uh, you're all aware of the World Wide Web, which uh, many people use for amusement. The World Wide Web started off as a way of physicists in CERN being able to share information with each other. Uh, what's his name who invented it? Had this idea of hypertext, where you could uh, share information with each other without actually talking to each other because of these in international collaborations. So what we're building in the... In the for, in, for example, when you go to a web page, you don't know where it is in the world, and if there's a link that you're interested in, you click on it, and you don't know or care where that page is stored in the world because it just appears in front of you. So what we're trying to do at the moment is to make computing power the same where there's a network of computers all over the world, and we as physicists will just submit uh, jobs to this uh, thing which is called a grid, and this job will go off looking for somebody that will execute it, that will give it computing resources. 
so when you run a job, instead of run, uh, doing a calculation on your desktop computer, you submit it in the grid, and you don't know whether the results are calculated in Japan or Korea or the, the Soviet Union or South America. All you know is that off it goes, and a few hours later it comes back with the results. And most of us believe that this uh, concept of grid computing will change the way computing is used, the way uh, the World Wide Web has changed it. Because before the World Wide Web, the way people used computers was completely different from the way they do now. And when uh, grid computing comes online, where essentially there's an, a semi-infinite amount of computing power available to every person on the planet, we don't actually know what people will do with that, but it will be different from what they do now. But actually, anyway, what I'm interested in coming out of that is whether we see this Higgs boson, and we know that we've uh, melted space-time back through the first uh, phase transition, and that we also want to know if we've actually produced dark matter in the lab. And all this, you should start seeing results from this in about two or three years. Thank you. a chance to change our uh, video uh, recording device here. Uh, one thing that I'm going to do during the intermission is those of you who came in and didn't get a membership uh, form, which is just something that tells you about all the great benefits of joining, look like this. Just put up your hand, please. And Elaine, can you pass these out? So if you just put up your hand if you didn't get one of those forms. And just take a look through it. It gives you some incentives to join. The other thing I was going to say is there are drinks in the back, so during your intermission, if you want to grab some, we'll, we'll do about five minutes and then we'll come back and take Q&A. Okay. This is for sale, and these two, and all the books at the back on that shelf, and those shelves, but unfortunately not that one. Yeah, I do. Yeah. 
I just love the way he writes. I just love him. Yeah. He, 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 could, he could just write recipe, different recipes for borscht. And, I haven't read that one. No, I, I haven't either. Um, He's giving a talk here next week. Yeah, that's what that's what made me pick it up. I don't know. Did you see I said it should start at seven? Or, no, seven thirty. We start must start at seven. Check the website it's at seven. Did you miss the beat? I missed the beginning. It really went through things fast. Fast. Like, unless yes. you're already really well versed. I, I caught the tail of it and I had no idea what he was talking about. You're a physicist.